Hello everyone and welcome to this video on the effect of anxiety on eyewitness testimony. So, by the time we are done, this is the type of question you'll be able to answer and any variation of it. Um, we'll cover a bit of research that will talk about the effects of, eyewitness of anxiety on eyewitness testimony. You should be able to write an essay on it and any type of outline or evaluate question as well. Okay, so anxiety has strong physical and emotional effects on people. Okay, now the problem is that sometimes we find that these effects are quite positive, whereas other times we find that these effects are quite negative. And there are, in fact, many research studies that suggest both. Um, so there are some of the things that we are going to look at now. Now I'm just going to flick up a couple of slides here. Um, just take a little look at the pictures and just think about what your eye is immediately drawn to. Now I imagine, for most of you, your eyes would have been immediately drawn to the weapon in each of those pictures. Makes sense, because the weapon, chances are, is the thing that's going to hurt you. Now, what I've just illustrated there is something known as the weapon focus effect. And that is something that was investigated by Johnson and Scott in 1976. Now what they did was they invited a load of participants for an interview somewhere. And then while those people were sat in the waiting room waiting for their interview to happen, participants heard an argument in the next room while they were seated in this waiting area, waiting for their interview. After the argument had finished, um, they then saw one of two things. Now, participants who were in a low-anxiety condition, they saw somebody walk out of the office where the argument had happened, holding a pen that was dripping ink. Whereas in the high-anxiety condition, participants saw somebody walk out holding a knife dripping blood. Now, what they found afterwards was that when they asked them to describe the person who walked out, recall was much worse in the high anxiety condition. Okay, it was 49% recall for the low anxiety condition and 33% recall for the high anxiety condition. And that research was where the phrase weapon focus effect came from. Johnson and Scott concluded that the reason that anxiety was uh, sorry the reason that recall was so low was actually because the people were more focused on the weapon that was being held than the face of the person holding the weapon and the reason being is because you want to keep an eye on that weapon because the weapon is the thing that is going to be hurting you should it come your way now that being said there's also research done on the positive impact of anxiety as well. And that was a piece of research done by Ewell and Kutschall in 1986. Now, this research was based on a real-life event. Um, participants were all witnesses to a shooting in a shop. So there were 21 witnesses, and 13 of them agreed to take part in this study. And what happened was, was that four to five months after the actual incident... Um, they asked them to, to you know, say what had happened and then what they said was compared to the original police report. Um, participants were also asked to judge how stressed they'd been. Um, and they were asked to do that on a seven-point scale. So what they then found was that recall accuracy of the events um, and the stress levels when they were recorded and when they were the, when they were then compared, they found that recall was actually better when stress levels were high. So there was 88% accuracy in those who experienced high levels of stress and 75% accuracy in those who experienced low levels of stress. So it's not a massive difference, but it's enough to think, well, hold on, you know, the anxiety may have had some kind of positive impact after all. So how do we then explain the contradictory findings? So what we'll use 
is something called the yerkes dodson law, or the inverted U theory. Now, essentially, if you can see the diagram in the corner there, it says that you need to reach an optimum level of emotional arousal in order to have optimal performance. If your emotional arousal isn't enough, then you'll just kick back and relax and not really pay any attention to anything. Um, whereas if your arousal is far too high, then you're going to impair your performance as well because all you're going to be thinking is panic, 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 fight or flight, get out of here, and you're not going to be focusing on anything. So actually what you need is an optimum level of arousal in order to actually perform at your optimum level. And that's what the yerkes dodson law looks at. It looks at the relationship between emotional arousal and performance. And it was then Deffenbacher in 1983 who applied that to eyewitness testimony and then essentially said lower levels of anxiety produce lower levels of recall accuracy. Um, however, levels of recall accuracy increase with anxiety up to a certain point and that certain point is your point of optimum performance okay so there's a nice little thing there for you to use um, to explain contradictory findings okay now those are the three pieces of research or the two pieces of research and the one theory that you can use in your outline section for this now I say outline section, some of them can also be used in the evaluation as well, which is what we're going to come on to now. So first off, you can actually use Yule and Kutchall as contradictory evidence. So if you, in your outline to an essay, for example, if you only outline Johnson and Scott, which you could do, there's nothing to say that you have to outline both of them unless the question specifically requires you to do so, then you could quite easily outline Johnson and Scott and say that, you know, anxiety reduces accuracy of recall and then use Yule and Kutchall to actually contradict those findings and say, well, no, hold on, Yule and Kutchall found that it doesn't decrease accuracy, it actually increases accuracy. And based on how much we know about the study, that would make a very nice chunky evaluation point because you can talk about what they did, what they found, and then the conclusions, and then you know what it actually means for the um, for the outline. So I won't go into any more detail on that one because obviously I talked about it before. Um, I'll just point out that it is a good one to use. Okay, moving on then, there's another limitation, and it's also research-based, and it's a limitation or it's contrary research for to the weapons focus effect. And it says the weapons focus effect might actually be irrelevant. So this was research done by Pickle in 1998, and they said that actually it's not the presence of a weapon or it's not the presence of something that's dangerous um, that is causing them to have lower recall, but it's actually the presence of something that's surprising. So what they did was they showed participants a video of a hairdresser's salon or hairdresser's scenario um, and they used a wallet, a handgun, a pair of scissors and a raw chicken as the handheld items and what they found was, was that eyewitness accuracy was actually significantly poorer in the high unusualness conditions, i.e. the conditions where people were holding the, ch the raw chicken or the handgun which then suggests that the weapons focus effect is actually due to the unusualness of a situation rather than the anxiety or the threat that the handheld item actually poses and therefore it doesn't actually tell us anything specifically about the effects of anxiety on eyewitness testimony. Okay, so you've got two evaluation points there. You can have one more. Um, it's a small one. Um, it's a limitation again, and it's an ethical issues one. Um, it's just a nice one to throw in at the end if you want, and that is that a lot of research into eyewitness testimony actually deceives participants. So, for example, Johnson and Scott, you had the fact that they thought that they were being invited to an interview. Um, the, also, they have this problem of protection from harm, which is an issue particularly for studies like Johnson and Scott's study. Um, 
because you know they exposed their participants to a man holding a bloodied knife uh, which could have caused extreme feelings of anxiety um, so you know these participants may have then left the experiment feeling exceptionally stressed anxious um, you know you never know you know whether one of the participants has um, known somebody who was the victim of a knife crime or they they if they themselves have been involved in something like that so that could have easily have triggered some kind of traumatic episode um, so yeah there was definitely an issue of protection from harm there as well so that's just a another evaluation point to throw in at the end if you wish but remember you've got Eulen Kutchall as contradictory evidence um, whether you use that as an outline point or whether you use it as an evaluation point that's up to you um, and also up to the kind of question that you get asked um, just very quickly if I come back to that which is there um, bear in mind that when you get an essay your essay title could be something along the lines of outline and evaluate two or more pieces of research into the effects of anxiety on eyewitness testimony in which case you might have to use this particular study um, as part of your outline but that being said if you don't um, get a specific question like that then you could also just talk about one study um, and then use you and Cutchall as an evaluation point if that's what you would like to do okay I'll pop that back to the end there um, and that's it, and I hope it's been useful. Thank you for listening.